Thanks, Andrew, and good morning, everybody, to our webinar, A New Model for Online Authentication, Implications for Policy and Government Applications. Uh, we have three speakers today. I'm Jeremy Grant, I'm Managing Director with the Chertoff Group. We're a global advisory firm uh, focused at the intersection of security and technology and advising clients around the globe uh, on the policy, technical, business, and finance implications uh, of different uh, developments in technology and security. We joined today by Brett McDowell, the Executive Director of the FIDO Alliance, and Paul Grassi, who's the Senior Standards and Technology Advisor at NIST. So a few opening remarks before I hand things off to Brett to talk about why authentication is important to government and policy. Uh, governments care about authentication quite a bit these days for a number of reasons. Uh, one, they need to protect access to their own assets. Two, authentication is key to uh, enabling more high-value citizen-facing services. If you don't actually know uh, that a citizen is really who they claim to be, it's quite difficult to put the next generation of digital government applications online. Third, governments are looking to empower the private sector uh, to also provide a wider range of high-value services to consumers. Uh, fourth, governments really concerned about protecting and securing assets in regulated industries. And fifth, government cares about promoting the adoption of good security practices across all elements of the private sector. As governments are looking for identity solutions, uh, they look for ones that can deliver not just improve security, but also privacy, uh, interoperability through adherence to standards, and better customer experiences. So as we'll talk about today, the FIDO Alliance is delivering on key policy priorities through a set of specifications that its members have developed over the last couple of years. Uh, you'll hear about how they're delivering on better security with authentication using strong asymmetric public key cryptography that's better than the old shared secrets model and allows the use of biometrics as a second factor in a way that's very secure and easy to use. Uh, you'll hear about how privacy is architected in upfront uh, to support both the EU privacy principles and other national privacy initiatives with common routes across the globe, uh, ensuring there's no linkability or tracking, that biometric data never leaves a device, and putting an emphasis on consumer control and consent. Uh, you'll hear about uh, interoperability and how it's ensured through adherence to open standards, as well as FIDO setting up a compliance and conformance testing uh, uh, suite. And finally, how usability uh, is being taken care of, because FIDO specifications were designed with the user experience first, with the goal of making authentication as easy as possible. First specifications to actually focus on security building, being built to support specific user needs as opposed to the other way around. Uh, so at this point, I'd like to turn things uh, sorry, one more slide. I just wanted to point out the FIDO specifications are offering governments newer, better options for strong authentication. Uh, but one thing that we're seeing is governments may need to update some policies to support the ways in which FIDO is different from previous technology approaches uh, for authentication. As a general uh, rule, as technology evolves, policy needs to evolve with it. And we are seeing that increasingly these days uh, as new modern authentication approaches uh, start to enter the market. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn things over to the Executive Director of the FIDO Alliance, uh, Brett McDowell. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and thanks to everyone who showed up today. And please do make use of this recorded webinar uh, to share this information uh, with your colleagues in the future. And I will guarantee that we will read every uh, comment that you make uh, in the survey to help make sure that we're delivering uh, the content that you want in this webinar series. So let me introduce FIDO, the solution, the problem space, the FIDO Alliance, uh, to give you some uh, level setting around what we're really doing here, how we're going about it, um, and then we'll continue into the specific application of FIDO in the government space. So first, let's start with the problem. The world has a password problem. And if you're on this webinar, chances are you're already well aware of these issues. But let me quickly illustrate the point. We have suffered data breaches. Each year, this data gets worse. So here's over 780 data breaches last year, um, 170 million records stolen. This is up 50% over the year before. And the cost analysis, one cost analysis study, uh, is looking at $3.8 million per breach to the enterprise. This is up 23%. Uh, since 2013, and I recently saw a headline that uh, data breach um, trends are up over 25% in 2016 already based on this point last year. So this story, unfortunately, keeps getting worse. And as an industry, we had to do something about it. And so we came together 
and we started working on what is the root cause of this problem and how can we address it. You might say, well, we already have strong authentication. If passwords vulnerabilities are the core problem here behind breaches and a lot of this cost that we have, then why don't people just turn on two-factor authentication using one-time passcodes? It's something we've had for a number of years. What's the problem? Why isn't this the solution? Well, here's why. Uh, they're often delivered by SMS, and there are reliability ch challenges with SMS and delays. Um, if you use dedicated devices, you end up with what we call the token necklace in our industry, lots of different dedicated tokens. Uh, they're still confusing, poor user experiences, and that really is largely uh, the critical reason why this is not solving the problem. You know, two-factor authentication is often introduced as an option, and we're seeing that users don't opt in for it. It's poor user experience. The only thing one password is two passwords from a usability perspective. And ultimately, these are still fishable credentials. They might expire in 30 to 60 seconds, but they still can be and are increasingly intercepted and reused for account takeover. So this is not the solution. Let's talk about what is. The new model is FIDO, Fast Identity Online. This is public key cryptography applied to online authentication in a way that delivers true interoperability between websites and devices, web browsers, and dedicated uh, security devices. To understand how we got to where we are with the FIDO solution, I want to start with what our original approach was. We recognized that information security as an industry approached increased security and authentication historically with a model that looks like this. It's a trade-off between security and usability. If you want more security, you must decrease convenience, decrease usability. That's the old paradigm and we threw that out the window. The paradigm that we applied before we started any of the technical work was we have to come up with a solution that is both more secure for all the obvious reasons, you know, to get away from a shared secret model that's fishable, but also we need to come up with something that's easier to use. If we don't solve usability, we haven't really gained anything. And we're certainly not going to reach the long tail. So now let's look at what's happening under the hood with authentication. The old model, what we call a shared secret, this means the user knows the secret. It's going to get them into their account. And they have to actually produce that secret uh, to the application, to the server, online, on the other end of the Internet connection. They have to actually type this in or provide it. It, we also call it a bearer token. Uh, this means that if I, if I get that secret, if I get that information, if I can socially engineer you, if I can trick you into giving it to me, if I can in, infect your device and read it using malware, key loggers, now I have the secret and I can get into your account. That's the old model. This is what we had to fundamentally change. And we changed that by introducing this logical structure called the FIDO authenticator into the architecture. So this is the key, this is the core idea of FIDO, it's introducing this authenticator. So this is a local authenticator to the user. This means that the two things we want out of authentication, good usability and good security, is now maximized in a two-step process. First step, user verification, using the best of breed usability techniques, which increasingly is looking like biometrics for a very fast and effective way for the user to identify themselves to their local device. And then, with the authenticator having done user verification, now turn around and use asymmetric public key cryptography for that increased security. And I'll show you what that looks like next. Here we are registering our FIDO authenticator. It's your smartphone your, or your laptop um, or a second factor security device. Step one, you're going to bootstrap using the credentials you already have. So maybe your username and password plus a one-time token. That's how you get started in your session. Then the, the server sends the invitation in step two to the user. 
Um, and the user provides that local verification. So when we're talking about password replacement, this is probably a biometric challenge. If we're talking about OTP replacement, this might be a dedicated uh, security device, such as a USB uh, key device, and you provide presence. So you give the user approval in step two, and what that does, that gives the FIDO authenticator permission, you've given that user verification permission to the FIDO authenticator in step three, to create a key pair, public-private key pair, and the private key is stored on the device, it never leaves the device. And then in step four, the public key is registered with the online service. And so that's the only information you're giving to the web application, is this public key that is matched to the private key that was created during registration. And now I'll show you what the authentication flow looks like. When you come back and it's time to be authenticated, the server will send its challenge here in step one. Now you have to provide that same local evidence. So now we're doing user verification. It's the same user that registered. Maybe that's a biometric challenge. You have to give the same biometric data. That then in step three gives the authenticator the permission in the user verification step to sign the challenge. And then that signed challenge is sent back to the server and that's how you're authenticated. The other point I want to make about the FIDO model and what we set out to do, we knew you couldn't solve this problem with a single product. It doesn't matter how big you are, how much market penetration you have, the password problem is too big for any one stakeholder, even any one government, to solve on their own. It had to be done with open standards. And the other part of open standards is that it delivers return on investment to everyone who makes that step to FIDO enable their application. Because you make that one-time investment in your infrastructure to be FIDO enabled, now you can interoperate with every FIDO authenticator in the world, and you can choose which authenticators to trust. The emerging consensus is that every it, people are trusting all certified authenticators. You can rate those in your own risk-based authentication backend uh, uh, over time. Um, and you don't have to do any more one-off integrations. This was a key barrier holding back solutions like biometrics in particular from taking off in the consumer space because prior to FIDO, the value proposition was integrate with this one biometric solution you know, and hope that it's the one that will work for you for the long haul. And it was quite brittle. And if you did want to add a different form factor or go with a different vendor, you had to do another integration into your infrastructure. FIDO takes all that away, it's a one-time investment, and now you can interoperate with everything you choose to interoperate with. So I briefly covered how FIDO solution was designed for and delivers better usability, better security, better return on investment. But also, a key part of today's webinar is going to focus on how it also delivers privacy by design. But I'm gonna let Jeremy go into that in more detail with you later. So in summary, FIDO delivers better security for online services, reduced cost to the enterprise, and it's simpler and safer for consumers in ways they never need to understand. They simply know it's more convenient, and this, was the ma this is the magic that we didn't have before with strong authentication. Now we have a strong authentication solution that defeats the most common attacks like phishing, uh, defeats the vulnerability of a data breach because there's no secrets on the server that to be reused if there is a data breach, and it delivers what we've been waiting for all this time, which is a better user experience. So now there's actual market demand to put this in place. So I'm gonna briefly introduce the FIDO Alliance itself. We have a very simple mission. We're gonna develop the FIDO technical solution through developing specifications. We're going to uh, develop and launch and operate programs to ensure the successful adoption of those standards like interoperability testing and certification. And we're going to be dedicated to the long-term viability and formal standardization of FIDO technology. Here's a picture of what we've done since we launched this alliance in early 2013 with, by the way, only a handful of companies, uh, six members to be precise. We developed the FIDO Ready program, which was an opportunity for companies with a solution based on pre-standard versions of our spec 
to go to market and to start building the brand awareness around this phyto solution. Then we published our first specification about one year after we formed for public review and feedback. We started to see the first deployments. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. And then we took FIDO 1.0 to final specification at the end of 2014. So that means about five quarters so far of the market looking at FIDO 1.0 being complete. And I'll talk about the kind of market acceptance we've seen in those five quarters. Then just one year ago, we introduced the certification program. Keep that in mind. Only one year we've been running that program because I'll tell you about how, how many people have taken advantage of it so far. And then the, the next piece of standardization work we did is we introduced new transport for our uh, second factor solution, uh, FIDO U2F, Universal Second Factor. Now, it now, it originally was launched in 2014 with support over USB, and it now has NFC and Bluetooth bindings. And ever since then, it's been about those adoption programs and watching the market grow. Now, some of the stakeholders. We have a very strong board of directors that is balanced between uh, key suppliers of technology and key users of technology. So we have companies like Microsoft, Google, and Intel, uh, really technology leaders on the supply side. Uh, we, have, we have companies like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, Bank of America, USAA, major relying parties or key relying parties uh, for the demand side. We wanted to make sure that all the decisions that we made in the Fight Alliance were balanced from both of those perspectives. And the organization has grown quite a bit. We now have uh, over 250 companies in the membership and three different membership levels. There's the board, there's the sponsor members who really populate our working groups and get that work done, and then there's the associate class of members. Uh, these are companies who might come to one of our big meetings per year but mostly they're involved to have, be a part of the intellectual property license that comes with FIDO membership. So I do see that we're having some technical difficulties, but we'll pick right up. There we are. So we can skip past the membership slides. Yeah, my, uh, my PowerPoint just crashed in the middle. I wonder if somebody else can pick up the slides and drive this. Well, I'll keep going with the introduction. I'm pretty familiar with the slides. Hopefully, we'll have a visual aid here in a moment. So, um, government and research. So, not only do we have uh, an alliance made up of private sector companies, but also government agencies now can join the FIDO Alliance. And we have government agencies involved from the United States, United Kingdom, Germany, um, and uh, government-sponsored, government-owned uh, research organizations uh, in China, as well as universities in Europe and the United States. Many liaison partners. One key liaison partner uh, I want to call out is the W3C, but we have over a dozen that we're working with, including Global Platform, Smart Card Alliance, uh, Bluetooth, SIG, but the W3C is the first partner that we've worked with in terms of uh, formal list standardization of our specifications. We have now successfully submitted the web API for the FIDO2 specification into W3C, and they have moved that forward now in a dedicated work group called the Web Authentication Working Group. And um, we are now well on our way to have FIDO solutions become the formal standard for strong authentication for the entire web platform. Now let me tell you a little bit more about the industry adoption uh, since that time. In 2014, uh, we had FIDO solutions. This was when we were still in draft specification, deployed by PayPal, uh, Alibaba. Alibaba is, really was the Alipay group in China. So you had major uh, market-leading payment wallet solution with PayPal and Alipay deploying FIDO as the very first deployment. So even though FIDO is not a payment technology, it's an authentication technology, obviously payment is a great use case for easier, faster authentication. And then Google deployed FIDO second factor solutions, what they call security key. 
Um, since then, in 2015, we saw many more solutions. Microsoft declared that their entire Windows 10 platform will be FIDO2 compliant. Uh, Qualcomm announced that they will be um, putting FIDO solutions in all their Snapdragon modules. Google added FIDO solutions for all their business customers. Entity Docomo has a massive deployment uh, in Japan. Over 100 different services are now FIDO enabled because they have made FIDO the basis of their authentication, the authentication foundation for their whole identity management solution. And if you are familiar with Entity Docomo, they have one of the most advanced uh, mobile identity solutions in the world. Dropbox, Bank of America, and GitHub all deployed FIDO solutions in 2015. And then this year, we're off to a very strong start of deployments. Uh, we have a couple of banks in Korea working with BC Card. They're the payments leader in Korea. And they uh, also are integrated in Samsung Pay in Korea. Um, and one that's probably especially interesting for this audience today is the UK government. They have deployed uh, the FIDO solution in their federation within the UK government, the UK Gov Verify. They have recognized, not only have they recognized one of their identity providers um, who is using FIDO for strong authentication, but by doing so, because of a program called IDAS, uh, EIDAS in Europe, that brings the FIDO credentials up to a level of being recognized across Europe. So a lot of momentum in terms of using FIDO for EID and eGov services. So now I want to talk a little bit about our certification program. It looks like we have the slides back. So here's how to go through the certification program. It is right, what we offer today is called functional certification, which means first you do conformance testing, which is self-validation. And once you are successful with the self-validation tools that we make available, then you attend an interoperability event. And very soon we're going to roll out on-demand interoperability so you can get certified whenever you feel the time is right for your product release. And there's a formal certification process as well as a trademark license agreement, and then you're off and running. And if you have customers using your solution, they have the same uh, trademark rights to the FIDO logo that you have by virtue of your certification. And here's a list of all the companies that have gone through the certification program so far. Over 150 different products have been certified. So uh, and it's not just um, technology uh, suppliers in niche markets. You have major companies um, like Google and eBay getting certified, as well as Hans manufacturers, which I'll highlight next. So here is a picture of the smartphones and tablets that have been FIDO certified. These are shipping out of the box with FIDO standard support built in and biometric sensors built in that work with that FIDO uh, authenticator. So you've got market leaders like Sharp, Samsung, LG, Huawei, Fujitsu, Sony, and there are even more than are viewed on this list coming out all the time. And it's not just the Android ecosystem. Entity Docomo and Bank of America are examples of two FIDO deployments that are using some of our specifications that work with iOS 9 to enable iPhones. Now, Apple is not yet embedding FIDO capability in their devices when the device ships, but third parties are able to develop and add FIDO capability to iPads and iPhones. The application developers themselves do not do that. So as you can see, there is tremendous momentum behind the FIDO ecosystem in a relatively short period of time, extremely short period of time from an industry standardization perspective. So I invite you to join the ecosystem. You can go to the website. You can start signing up for self-test tools. It's all free of charge. Um, and also, if you're interested in being directly involved in the decisions we make, um, being a stakeholder, building uh, certified products, I invite you to join the FIDO Alliance. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jeremy. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate that overview of the Alliance and all of its activities. Now we're going to turn to Paul Grassi, who's the Senior Standards and Technology Advisor at NIST to provide a bit of perspective on FIDO and government services. Over to you, Paul. 
Great. Thanks, Jeremy. Thanks, Brett. So, um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I work with uh, NIST. I'm in the um, National Program Office for the uh, Trust uh, <laughs> National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, uh, which is part of our Applied Cybersecurity Division. Um, you know, why why does NIST care um, about what's going on in, in FIDO? And, and as you saw from the slide there, that just popped up and went away. Um, you know, we've got a significant a set of equities in, in strong cybersecurity um, using market-driven um, approaches that are standards-based. Um, this is a quote from a friend of mine at DHS, encryption would not have helped. Um, it's from a, a recent uh, breach of federal systems. Uh, the point being here, um, our issue was completely driven by poor credentials. Username and password uh, was gained access to. Uh, to strongly encrypted data, that username and password was used to decrypt, and we had a significant amount of exfiltration. Um, we are uh, seriously um, um, adopting strong auth uh, technologies to protect government services, and, and of course, our, our primary is the um, is the, the smart card PIV. But we have many many use cases here that we think FIDO uh, and the suite of technologies that that come underneath the FIDO specification could offer. So, you know, NIST really cares um, about what's going on in industry. Anytime there's a way to enhance industry, the economy, cybersecurity, privacy in the U.S., from a standards perspective, on a global scale, we participate. Our, only, our job is not only to create um, federal government standards and guidelines. In fact, um, my goal, my personal goal, and some that uh, folks in my office share, is that when we can, we are not special. We do not want to create requirements that are special to the federal government unless there's a really good reason to do so. So we spend a lot of our time out in the private sector working in these open forums to develop um, internationally um, interoperable standards. So from a FIDO perspective, there's a lot of, um, of uh, um, alignment with what we're trying to solve in government identity and in the way we approach uh, the marketplace and private sector adoption of, of good identity. Um, as you've seen, or as you will hear from Jeremy, um, right out of the box, a FIDO credential is privacy enhancing. There's, there's no way, it's built into the spec that there's no way to track and profile user behavior online. Um, and I won't spend a lot of time going over what, what we've rehab or what Brett has talked about um, in terms of the, the public key cryptography, but but certainly using strong cryptographic public key cryptography uh, standards, uh, significant security and resilience on the biometric side. The, the biometric never leaves the, the device. It always stays local. Um, so there's a, a strong goal of preventing at scale um, attacks. Um, interoperable, uh, as Brett mentioned, no longer does relying parties have to worry about picking the right biometric modality or the right form factor. Um, they can choose from a whole host of authenticators and be interoperable with those. And then probably most important, um, not only based on the number of devices that ship with it out of the box, uh, the ability to uh, have an authenticator that is personal to you but still works in many, many places. And, you know, frankly, commercially, uh, the, the credentials are pretty darn cheap. So we saw GitHub, um, G Google is, is protected with FIDO U2F. And those are already available um, on Amazon for a pretty reasonable cost. So that's at a high level why we care. These, uh, what FIDO does out of the box aligns directly with what our mission is here at NIST. So um, really where the rubber meets the road is, is in the, the host of use cases that U.S. government um, is concerned about. Uh, we, we heard about what's going on in the U.K. in terms of uh, their verified U.K. system. We've got a, a kind of a twin to that in connect.gov and the, the, the transition from that from pilot to fully operational out of GSA. Uh, our roadmap there includes uh, FIDO capabilities. Uh, it's important to us to not have to mint our own credentials uh, for users and allow them to come and bring their own. Um, this is the FirstNet logo, but it's not just FirstNet that we care about when we look at all of the emergency response and emergency communications use cases that are out there, and the significant amount of, of um, diversity in the 
environmental conditions that these people operate in, uh, there's absolutely a um, alignment with FIDO and the various form factors, whether they be uh, biometric or otherwise. If we've got you know, firemen in the field that need strong access to a mobile device, their biometric, if we choose that, is going to be completely different than maybe a, a police officer or EMS or even industry support and post-disaster um, uh, handling. Um, and again, since they're mobile-based and FIDO is already deployed on many, many handsets, we've got a pretty um, solid case for looking into this type of uh, deployment for, for them. So as you may know in the federal government, the uh, PIV smart card is our gold standard for employees and contractors. We've got an excellent set of guidance out there on derived credentials that basically piggyback off the strong identity proofing that was part of issuing that, um, that original PIV. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of instances where agencies have been successfully de deploying derived credentials. We do have a policy right now where uh, derived credentials need to be PKI interoperable, um, where FIDO is just PK. So, you know, given the natural evolution and the fact that FIDO is, is now commercially available, um, post the issuance of some of our guidelines, you know, we're working right now with, with leaders inside of NIST and inside of OMB to, to determine if there's viability to having a FIDO server potentially run alongside of something like a PKI server so we can have strong interoperability. And I'll talk a little bit about more, talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Other use cases, um, this is one of my personally favorite. Um, we have a community of contractors and employees that for usually good mission reasons aren't eligible for a PIV. Um, and what do we do instead? We end up giving them usernames and passwords, as you saw in that earlier slide, the quote from Dr. Osman, that, that is no longer acceptable. So why not issue them something um, else? Maybe the smart card is not acceptable in their mission space, but something else is. Uh, so we, we need to broaden that policy. Um, it's not really showing up very well, but that's OMB M0524. Um, you know, can we look beyond just PIV smart cards and have interoperability and strong authentication ride together for this population that right now we treat as exceptions? And then finally, maybe a little bit of a stretch, but certainly something that you know rides alongside of this population of users that don't get a PIV. Is there a way we can use mo uh, FIDO standards for physical security? And right now there are a host of authenticators that are out there that speak, you know, NFC and can communicate with readers and, and allow um, for physical security access to uh, buildings. Next slide. Well, I'll start talking here while we wait for that to load. I hope I didn't put in, in too much animation. Um, oh, good. So this is a... A life cycle flow chart from our derived credential um, specification that I referenced earlier. Um, a lot of um, low-level PKI PIV related things happening here, but if you really look at this um, life cycle and this business process, um, the, the, the part highlighted in blue is really when we start talking about what the derived, when the derived credential comes in place. So if I show up with a smart card um, and follow this process. There's nothing in this business flow that would keep a FIDO type credential from, from being issued. Right now, the, the only um, reason that's not directly in there is because of the PKI reference I mentioned earlier. And we still have you know, some due diligence to do before we would ever loosen or change that requirement. I don't believe it's a loosening, but we certainly have to change it. But from a business process perspective, there's nothing keeping um, an agency from potentially issuing other types of form factors and still being in complete alignment with this, this special publication. And then when you look at some of the security requirements we have around where the credential can live, um, does it have to be in a secure element? Does it need to be on, a, on something like a trusted platform module? Um, you know, at the various levels of assurance that FIDO credential or that the derived credential spec requires. Um, again, I think FIDO has a broad set of applicability to those various um, LOAs up to level four. Um, so there's really nothing in terms of our, our guidelines that needs a, a significant amount of facelift to support the credential. Um, it really boils down to a, a risk-based decision um, on the part of uh, policy and, and standards developers on, 
whether we are okay with a um, PK and PKI infrastructure running together. Now, the you know the, the argument against that, which is very valid, is well, when you issue a certificate, you can revoke that only that certificate, and um, you know then access is is removed for that user. And in the FIDO privacy model, we may have a little bit of a challenge there. But again, nothing that business process and a, and a deployment like similar to what's going on in J uh, Japan, NTT Do Docomo couldn't solve. If we bind a FIDO credential with an enterprise ID and federate. Uh, we can obtain the same usability and security uh, characteristics that are inherent with a with a PKI certificate. We can revoke that identity at the uh, federated IDP. That federated identity is bound to that FIDO credential, and poof, access is removed. So I definitely think there's an opportunity for us in government to explore uh, an expansion of of acceptable credential types and and um, protocols for um, strong government identity. So final, uh, there's two more slides here that I want to talk about briefly, and I'll, I'll get back to Jeremy so we can get to the, the questions. Uh, this is taken on a couple of activities, which is based on um, measurement science of various identity management di disciplines. The one I want to talk about specifically is, is credentials. Um, identity proofing and attributes are are certainly applicable, but when it comes to the FIDO-specific use case, we're really interested in, in measuring the strength of a credential. And what we're uh, focusing on first is strength of a biometric. It's not enough for a biometric authenticator to um, assert its performance properties, how many false matches, how many false non-matches. That only gets us part of the way. So we are looking at evaluating the entire scope of a biometric system from presentation all the way to matching and the results from that. And I think there's a, there's a chart on the next slide that looks at the, uh, an abstraction of a, of a biometric system. And our goal here is to um, ultimately try to find a biometric equivalent of, of entropy, um, which, which is not been done and, and is difficult to do, but we think we can get there uh, with the combination of many factors and looking at the, the deployment of mitigations to a host of, of biometric system vulnerabilities. And then what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to um, potentially in the FIDO certification and assertion model have an authenticator assert to a relying party its quote unquote biometric entropy. And don't, don't, um, quote me as that being the official name, that, that's more of an abstraction of what we're trying to accomplish. But if we can do that, then, then these relying parties can make risk-based decisions about whether they would accept that biometric authenticator in um, gaining access to a transaction, whether that transa transaction be low risk or high risk. And in some cases, a relying party will say, look, I don't really care about the security of the underlying biometric. I just want to give a really easy and convenient way to access my, my transactions, my services, so it doesn't matter. In other cases, if I'm if I'm using this biometric to do transaction confirmation, uh, such as authorizing a, a bank withdrawal or a bank transfer, then then you care. So we are spending a lot of time looking at this um, problem set. We're working with the FIDO Alliance on this. There's a biometric subgroup that is is looking at the various pieces of metadata that a biometric authenticator should be asserting to relying parties. We're really excited about the progress we've made here, and and, and think we will have. Um, in the near, ter near term, um, a proposal out on how we can actually get to a calculation of, of uh, entropy for biometrics. And again, I say that with air quotes because the, the crypto guys would say, and they're right, it's, it's impossible that the, the, the two don't really pair well, but we want to be able to compare apples to apples, and this is the one way we think we can do it. So um, if you go two more slides, just one last up or comment. Um, one more, please. There we go. So 863-2 is, is the guideline that um, specifies how federal agencies um, need to interact with, um, exter with external stakeholders um, on public websites. Um, and we have put a significant amount of time in, in updating uh, this version to Dash 3, and we'll be releasing that in the next couple days, uh, maybe a week. Uh, we spent a lot of time 
um, figuring out the valid type of authenticators. I won't, I won't go on about all the updates. That's, that could take an hour in and of itself. Um, but we quickly realized that 863-2 um, could do a little bit more in terms of specifying the valid set of use cases for this, this kind of bring your own credential. It's always been friendly to um, specs like, like FIDO, uh, two examples being uh, the fact that some tokens are, are actually software or hardware cryptographic tokens. Those have always been allowed. And then on the biometric side, um, we've always allowed, you know, quote unquote activation of a token through a biometric. That's exactly what FIDO does. So the, the, the document itself has always been friendly to these types of authenticators. We've gone a little step, gone a step further in this update to um, help agencies, assist agencies in some of the technical workflow if somebody actually so, shows up with their own authenticator. 63-2 um, uh, does a lot around issuance. Um, and that paradigm, uh, because of uh, organizations like FIDO and their memberships, has sort of been um, flipped on its head where users are actually bringing their own. Well, how do you, in a confident and secure and trustworthy way, um, bind identity token that they're bringing with, bringing with them? Um, so we spent some amount of page space uh, creating normative requirements on how agencies can do that, and we're really excited about this update. So. Look for that in the next couple of days. It'll be, we're actually doing it out on GitHub, which is uh, a new approach for us um, and, and one that we hope will resonate with the community. We'll be working over the summer um, with um, everyone that wants to participate in the public to um, actually update this document in near real time um, with our stakeholder community rather than um, behind closed doors on our own. So thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Back to you. Hey, thanks, Paul. Appreciate the uh, the perspective. And by the way, for a bit of additional perspective, it's worth noting that Paul and Brett co-authored a blog post that uh, went up on the FIDO website yesterday, entitled "How FIDO Can Help the U.S. Government Go Mobile." It's a good uh, companion to some of the information in today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to take over the next section to provide a few perspectives on FIDO in the global policy environment. Um, so FIDO engagement on policy issues, you know, Brett gave you the, the background on, on FIDO's formation before. This is not a very old organization, just a bit over three years old. Uh, but FIDO launched a public policy and privacy working group uh, known as the P3WG in 2014. And it really had a, a sort of a, a dual-headed mission. The first is how to focus on privacy by design approach to FIDO specifications, providing privacy expertise and guidance uh, to some of the folks coming at uh, the FIDO specifications from a technical perspective and making sure that different elements of privacy were really architected in uh, to the specifications up front. Uh, as you know, we talked about a little bit previously, not every form of strong authentication or identity solution protects privacy. In fact, some models uh, actually create a number of privacy risks that need to be addressed. FIDO was really focused on privacy by design up front and uh, this has been the body that has uh, helped to ensure that. Uh, the second is monitoring global privacy and public policy issues that impact authentication and looking for FIDO to engage in education efforts where appropriate. So the, uh, the co-chairs of the working group are Hannes Schofeneg from ARM and Stefan Samoji from Google. Uh, and you know, the group's been uh, increasingly active lately. Um, at a high level, you know, I wanted to talk just for a minute, uh, why is it that policy matters? Well, governments around the world are focusing on identity and authentication requirements, both for their own systems as well as systems and in industries that they regulate or influence. And, you know, drivers are, are pretty numerous for these enhanced requirements, you know, including both the increased number of attacks that are tied to passwords in both the public and private sector, as well as the need for more secure consumer or citizen facing digital services. And, you know, one thing we've seen, I hinted at this a bit earlier, is as governments engage here, uh, supports for new approaches and technologies like FIDO is not a given. Uh, we find a lot of governments are not aware of FIDO, or if they are, they don't properly understand it and, and how it works and how it's different from other approaches to authentication. Um, this is not unusual, by the way, and it's not meant to be a critique of, of government or policymakers. I think there's generally a natural gap uh, across the globe between technology innovation and then the understanding of that innovation by policymakers and regulators. Uh, a lot of what we've been trying to do uh, with uh, the FIDO Alliance's engagement has been looking for ways uh, to close that gap and educate uh, uh, different influencers and policymakers about what FIDO is and, and how things are different. So 2016 has actually been a busy year for the Alliance. We're just over four months in. 
Uh, in January, uh, FIDO published a privacy white paper that looked specifically at privacy from the user experience and did a comparison uh, of how FIDO's privacy principles and specific features of the technical specifications align with both EU privacy principles as well as uh, similar principles in the US. We'll uh, dive into that in a bit more detail in some future slides. Uh, in February, FIDO submitted a pretty lengthy response, uh, probably about 20 pages, to the European Banking Authority. Uh, the EBA uh, had published a discussion paper in late 2015 looking at future draft technical standards on strong customer authentication and secure communications under the new payment services directive, uh, the PSD2 uh, that was published in Europe earlier in the year. Uh, PSD2, uh, for those who don't have background on it, uh, is a uh, new rule in Europe that will, uh, as the name would suggest, govern a lot of different facets about how payments are made, really sets out a modern uh, technical and, and regulatory infrastructure. Authentication was one of the areas that the EBA, uh, when they put PSD2 out, said they needed to come back and work on more details. Uh, and after the, the discussion paper went out, laying out some ideas, FIDO uh, uh, reached out to engage with EBA uh, through this response. Uh, by the way, all of these things that we're talking about, the white paper, our different uh, RFI and, and discussion paper responses are all found on the FIDO website. Uh, in March, uh, NIST uh, had put out an RFI looking for updates to the NIST framework for improving critical infrastructure cybersecurity. Uh, for those who aren't familiar with the framework, uh, this was something that NIST was directed to create through an executive order President Obama had issued in 2013. It was actually published in February of 2014 and it lays out a number of different controls and best practices on how organizations should manage cyber risk, looking at ways to identify, uh, protect, detect, respond, and recover uh, to different cyber risks. Uh, the original uh, framework did not include any recommendation for use of strong authentication, uh, in part because of concern about the lack of standards that were out there, and the NIST response uh, that the FIDO Alliance submitted highlighted the good standards work that has gone on in the two years since the framework was first uh, as well as the fact that many of the identity and authentication related attacks have gotten much worse. Uh, FIDO also participated in a workshop at NIST uh, later that month. And finally, uh, FIDO has been engaged internally on building a more active, having a more active process uh, to inventory and monitor different authentication related policies across the globe, not just in the US and Europe, uh, but in other, uh, other continents as well. So, you know, there's some common themes that come across. You know, the U.S. is not Europe, Europe is not Asia, uh, but there are some core themes that, you know, seem to keep popping up no matter what uh, the government is uh, that's looking at this issue. And so, you know, we've come up with a few uh, points uh, that we think are important for governments to keep in mind as they're contemplating these issues. Uh, the first is something that Brett touched on earlier, which is recognizing that two-factor authentication no longer brings higher burdens or costs. Uh, it was just six months ago uh, that the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, specifically the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, uh, published its 2015 Health IT Certification Criteria, and there was a long discussion in there about whether they should put mandates in place for use of multi-factor authentication, uh, both for internal-facing systems and healthcare organizations, as well as for patient-facing applications. And one of the things that they cited when they chose not to put any requirements in place uh, was noting that a commenter had pointed out that the current approaches to multi-factor authentication are costly and burdensome to implement. So while this statement was certainly true of a lot of old MFA technology, FIDO, as we talked about earlier, specifically addresses these costs and usability issues. FIDO is designed to enable simpler, stronger authentication, uh, authentication capabilities that governments, businesses, and consumers can easily adopt at scale. Uh, you don't have security and usability at odds with each other anymore. Uh, you now actually have uh, new technology uh, that doesn't force an organization to choose between one or the other. Uh, second, uh, we think it's important for governments to recognize that technology has now gotten mature enough to enable two secure, distinct authentication factors in a single device. Uh, this has been an issue that's come up for years and that a lot of best practices for strong authentication would require uh, in many cases, say, two shared secrets, one which would be a password, something you know, and one would be uh, something that you have or something that you are, such as, say, a one-time password uh, that would be on a token that would be in your possession or perhaps texted to you. Uh, it was a model that made sense for a long time, the notion of having two different channels for the delivery of uh, an authenticator, um, but technology has evolved quite a bit, particularly with mobile, so that you can now actually have two distinct factors in a single device. 
Uh, this was something uh, that NIST actually recognized in 2014 when it issued uh, special publication 800-157. Uh, this was the derived credential specification uh, that uh, Paul Grassi was talking about. In the bulletin that accompanied the release of it, uh, NIST noted that OMB, which is part of uh, the White House, for those who don't know uh, the acronym, uh, will, as part of uh, the release of 800-157, update guidance on remote electronic authentication to remove requirements that one factor be separate from the device that's actually accessing the resource. And the reason for that's simple. The evolution of mobile devices, in particular uh, new hardware architectures uh, embedded in these devices that offer highly robust and isolated execution environments. Think things like uh, the Trusted Execution Environment, or T, uh, the Secure Enclave or Secure Elements, uh, or TPM chips uh, in uh, uh, different laptops and desktops has now allowed these devices to achieve high-grade security without the need uh, to carry a separate physically distinct token. Essentially, the, the great you know, uh, capabilities that we had that required separate tokens years ago are now shipping standard in many commercial devices, and this is something the government can take advantage of. So you know, certainly in the US, the government has realized that there is a need to shift, uh, but we still find a lot of other governments around the world have not paid attention to what NIST and the White House have said or, or, or looked at how the architectures have changed themselves. The third item is as governments promote or require strong authentication, make sure it's the right type of strong authentication. Uh, the market's in a burst of innovation around this technology. Some solutions are better than others. We think it's important the governments don't push the adoption of old authentication technology. Uh, old technology uh, poses uh, significant costs and burdens on the user, which will decrease adoption. And old authentication technologies uh, have security and privacy issues, including, for example, uh, being fishable. Uh, that puts you know, both users as well as online service providers at risk. And finally, uh, FIDO is designed to enhance privacy. Brett talked about this a little bit before. It was designed from the start to uh, support the privacy principles of the European Data Protection Directive, uh, Directive and other government uh, privacy initiatives. Uh, there's no third party in the protocol. Uh, there's no secrets on the server side. If biometrics are used, and they don't have to be, but if they are used, FIDO specifies that the biometrics can never, ever leave the device. Biometrics are only used for local match. Uh, there aren't link there's not linkability or tracking between services, and there's no linkability or tracking uh, between accounts, uh, meaning that every uh, FIDO authenticator, even if you're using your same mobile device to log into seven or eight different sites, every one of those gets its own distinct public-private key pair there's no way to actually link the use of uh, that device across uh, other service providers. Uh, just to drill deeper, uh, FIDO and user privacy in the US, uh, I mentioned before the white paper that was published on privacy in January, which is available on the FIDO website. Uh, uh, here the alliance mapped its privacy principles against the identity ecosystem steering group requirements. Uh, for those who don't know the IDESG, it's a privately led organization uh, that was founded uh, several years ago to support implementation of the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, or NSIC. This was the Obama Administration Secure Identity Initiative. Um, and you know, it's led today you know, by the private sector with government participation. They have 15 distinct privacy requirements uh, here. This is an example of how the paper uh, matches uh, to, uh, to each of them. Uh, uh, we basically talk about how each of the FIDO privacy principles was designed specifically to align with the requirements that the uh, IDESG has come up with. And on the European side, uh, the white paper also uh, highlights uh, the same. Um, you know, there are a number of different EU privacy principles that are part of the uh, European uh, Data Protection uh, Directive. Uh, and FIDO, again, you know, was designed you know, from the start. How do we actually look at ways to not just align with them, but actually enable better privacy. Uh, and so, you know, whether it's personal data being processed fairly and lawfully, uh, making sure the personal data is accurate and up to date, that it must be kept secure. Uh, I obviously don't want to read everything on the slide, but I would uh, recommend people look at, uh, at the white paper. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, uh, FIDO from a policy perspective, and a market perspective enables better security for online services, uh, reduces costs for the enterprise, and at the end of the day, it's simpler and safer, safer for consumers. Um, we've just got a few questions left, and so I want to actually turn uh, to questions that have come in from the audience during this, and uh, let me you know, dive into this a little bit and ask you know, Brett and uh, Paul if they can answer the questions. Uh, one of the first ones that came in, uh, was uh, do uh, some of these OEMs that Brett was listing before actually have FIDO clients embedded? Uh, is it native in the browser uh, or both? And also, are the authenticators available to everybody? Yeah, I'll take that, Jeremy. Uh, this is Brett. 
So when a handset is certified, it could be certified to fight a UAF spec, to fight a U2F spec. Um, the slide I presented were handsets certified to the FIDO UAF spec, mean, meaning there is a FIDO UAF client that, yes, is embedded in the device and works with the native sensor on that device. Now, some, most, most of those devices, it was integrated with the fingerprint sensor, but in the example of Fujitsu, it's integrated with the camera that does uh, iris recognition. So th that's the answer to that question. Right, thanks. Uh, next question, I think this is probably for Paul. For U.S. government uh, consumer-oriented services, is the government expecting to rely on FIDO public-private key pairs directly deployed on the user's device, or do you think you need to go the federated route and rely on a third-party identity provider, which will then require a user to authenticate uh, with FIDO strong authentication? I think the jury's still out on that, but the model we're, we're currently adopting for consumer services is certainly federated. Um, but we want to not um, limit all options. If, if user choice is such where they want to interact directly with, with government in a more point-to-point um, -point basis, then, then potentially we would consider that. The problem with that, though, is, is it does degrade some of the benefits of, of having a um, hub-based approach uh, for a couple of reasons. One is, is um, we've got to do the identity proofing um, of users uh, eventually to get them at least to high value services, uh, certainly not the, the um, lower risk ones or the ones where no identity is needed. Uh, and secondarily, is we, we want to have the economic benefits and interoperability benefits of kind of have a one-stop shop to, for agencies to connect. So having multiple FIDO servers deployed across government so every agency can be their own um, FIDO-relying party may not make a whole lot of sense, but certainly as this uh, ecosystem evolves, uh, everything's on the table, but but again, right now, um, I think the federated provider uh, way is the approach uh, that would be the most compelling right now and would mirror pretty much what's going on in the UK. Thanks. A, a final question. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot on the privacy side uh, about how FIDO is designed uh, with privacy architected in from the start, but I'm wondering if either of you could talk about what happens if you don't build privacy in? Are there other examples of identity solutions or authentication solutions that have hit the market uh, that bring privacy concerns? Uh, you know, what lessons have been learned in the past that you know, FIDO has now been trying to make sure uh, are addressed uh, from a privacy perspective in this set of standards? I could take part of that. I think, I think Brad's probably got some input as well. I mean, Certainly built into um, the authenticator, this is one of the first and I think only um, specs um, at this scale certainly that has this privacy protection built in. Um, that said, um, in the solutions that in my office is um, advocating for and, and in many cases funding, um, and then certainly on the government side of GSA, you know, we're advocating for building a similar uh, set of controls in elsewhere in the architecture. We want to afford um, citizens uh, doing business with the federal government those characteristics of, of unlinkability, untraceability, the, the inability to profile, and, um, you know, in some cases the inability for um, governments and service providers to, to learn about each other because that also could have a negative impact to the business. So, um, you know, we're, we're taking a lot of the techniques that are um, baked into FIDO and, and pushing them el elsewhere in the architecture so we can afford this benefit to a, a range of authenticators. Again, user choice is extremely important to us. So while, while FIDO uh, provides for that in the fact that it's, it's um, vendor neutral and deployed on a, on a host of, of products, um, there may be other use cases where a, a citizen just won't come with a FIDO credential and we, get, we need to give them those privacy protections. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's some advanced cryptographic um, approaches uh, being taken um, out there, some, some more academic than others that have some uh, real viability when it comes to a privacy perspective. So, um, you know, consumer-wise, FIDO is one of the first, um, but we're, we're excited for a, a range of options in the future. I would just add that it was a very deliberate decision 
that received a lot of attention in the early design uh, of FIDO. Uh, we, in fact, convened all the members to have a intense debate over whether FIDO should have a uh, global unique identifier for every authenticator, which would help with some fraud mitigation uh, use cases, or should absolutely deliver nothing that could ever be used for tracking um, and should require, uh, you know, uh, that the biometric templates, if used, never leave the device. And we came out uh, firmly on privacy by design. But you could imagine um, people who work in, in the anti-fraud teams kind of salivating over the idea that they would have this indemnable identifier, but the, there are negative consequences to that. And so some of the solutions that are in market that do have those GUID solutions you know, they come with some privacy baggage, and, and we didn't want to burden FIDO with that. So very deliberate to make sure that FIDO delivered nothing that could be used for tracking online, you know, in addition to whatever tracking techniques already exist. FIDO doesn't, uh, you know, redefine the way the web works, but in terms of what we add, we add nothing that could be used for tracking. Thanks. Great perspective. Well, we're right around the hour mark. We're going to wrap things up today. I'd like to thank our panel participants and all of you in the audience who took time to learn about uh, FIDO and some of the uh, impacts on, uh, on policy and government. Uh, we invite you to connect with us online uh, at the FIDO Alliance on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, SlideShare, and uh, wish you all a great day. Thank you.